All right, it's my turn. Hi, everybody. Hi, family. My name is Nicolette. I'm an alcoholic. Um, I'm grateful, grateful member of Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm uh, glad to be here. Thanks for calling me back. Thank you for the invitation. You know, I get to participate in my recovery. It's a really special day. I, I uh, feel a lot of emotion today because today is my sponsor's birthday. And it's a big one. I'm not going to say the number, but it is her birthday. And I just think of her and I think of, you know, I celebrate her and I celebrate her existence and her life and uh, what she represented for me in this journey of Alcoholics Anonymous from the day that I met her until um, today. Um, you know, uh, you asked me to speak on step 12. Uh, I think it's the step that keeps me in the game. It uh, makes me feel alive. It's uh, uh, given so much. It's so fresh. It's so real. It's so uh, personal. And, uh, uh, you know, it's really the step of the heart, really. It's an expression of love. It's an expression of the awakening um, as a result of working the steps. And step 12, it says, you know, it says itself, like having had a spiritual awakening as a result of the steps. That's the first part of it. Having had a spiritual awakening as a result of the steps indicates I've been asleep prior to make the, having an experience with the steps. And now something woke up, right? I've woken up. My heart has woken up. Um, I operate uh, from a different system. <laughs> the previous one was a failed system from the neck up. I was operating from my mind and selfishness and self-centeredness and what's in it for me. And now, you know, this like uh, spiritual surgery occurred and the heart has woken up. And, uh, and uh, a byproduct of that is that I want to carry the message. I want to I wanna invite others to this solution. You know, I want to shout the good news, you know, um, uh, you know, because I know that there is a solution. I've experienced it. And then because it's loaded with spiritual principles, maybe I can live this way of life. I can carry this message to anything and anyone that's in front of me and live this way of life. Um, my sober date is September 15, 2006. My solution to my alcoholism the night before under the influence of alcohol was to end my life. That was my final solution. All others failed. I, uh, you know, had this profound experience that occurred in a split second. Time stopped. There was a manipulated pause and there was an intuitive thought to ask for help in the most genuine way. I felt cornered and surrendered and defeated. And... Um, you know, that's where my journey into uh, recovery really begins. Um, you know, I, uh, so then the next day is my sober date. I was locked down in treatment for four months. I didn't want to leave. I felt safe there. I, uh, <laughs> that was my second solution to my alcoholic problem is to be locked down. <laughs> because, you know, when we have this step one experience, you know, for me, my step one experience was a realization that I was very, very sick and that I was going to drink. I was going to drink no matter what. I always drank no matter what. Up until that point, that was my experience. I always drank more than I intended to drink. And uh, I couldn't draw a sober breath. So even though the mental obsession was removed um, on September 14, 2006, under the influence of alcohol. I uh, only felt safe in a lockdown setting. I didn't trust myself and I uh, didn't trust my mind. And I realized I didn't know how to live and I didn't really feel alive. But there was a willingness and a hunger to, uh, you know, there was an openness. I was open. After four months of being locked down, they said, you got to go. And I didn't want to leave. I didn't want to leave. So those two solutions was the best I could come up with. End my life or be locked down in a mountain, on a mountaintop somewhere away from civilization. <laughs> that was my solution to my alcoholism. <laughs> and uh, they were like, you got to go. <laughs> and I said, I don't want to leave. And they were like, that's exactly, that exactly means you're ready to leave. And so I put myself in a sober house in New Jersey and to rebuild my life, but still have some accountability and be surrounded by others because I was so scared. 
And two days later, I met my sponsor. <laughs> that was January of 2007. Can you tell that I'm still grateful? I mean, my tears say more than my words, you know? The book talks about attraction rather than promotion. She was attractive. She was attract attractive. I didn't trust myself and I didn't trust life and I didn't feel safe in life. And yet she had this aura of safety and trust. You know, she exuded humility and confidence at the same time. She presented herself as though she was a woman with a real answer. <laughs> you know, you know, she was awake. She's had a spiritual awakening as a result of working the steps. She was a phenomenal member of Alcoholics Anonymous. She was all in and she landed in front of me, open and willing to, um, you know, Hold my hand, hold my hand through the journey. So when I think about step 12, my first tangible experience of step 12 is her, her. She represented AA and she represented the message and she represented what was possible and available. She was the invitation. And, um, you know, she said, uh, <laughs> she pretty much confirmed to me how sick I was. <laughs> she qualified me. And she allowed me the dignity to qualify myself so that I knew how much trouble I was in and what was I, what I was up against. And she told me that she was going to take me through the journey of the 12 steps as outlined in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. And that she asked only for one thing and one thing only, that I do that for somebody else. And I had no idea what she was talking about, but I was like, yes, yeah. Definitely. You know, did I think that I would or that I could? No, probably not. Did I even understand half the things what she was talking about? No. Did I think that I could do it? No. But boy, did I want what she had. And I couldn't even verbalize what she had. I didn't have the words for it. That was the attraction. I trusted her. And I trusted the direction she was giving me out of the big book as she, uh, you know, went through the big book with me and as she held my hand through each step, you know, so when I had doubt on when I got stuck or when I didn't think that I could do it or, uh, you know, I trusted her and I was willing to be honest with her. And that's how I gained experience with each step. And I had an incredible experience with each step, which empowered me to take a step forward into the next step and got me curious about the next step. And it was just more than just like taking me through the work. It was just her presence during the fifth step. It was her, uh, the way she would pause when I would come with certain questions. You know, it was like that, like pause. Like she trusted something. She was getting information from some other place than the mind, right? It, there was like, it was incredibly inspiring to watch her. Like, I wanted that. I wanted that. And uh, I had this experience with the 12 steps and I have experience with each step. I remember after the fifth step, you know, we sat all day. She had this like presence about her during the fifth step. And uh, I remember after the fifth step, I felt like a member of Alcoholics Anonymous for the first time. There's something about that experience that made me feel like I was in, you know, it just, and again, it's an experiential program, right? We have to experience it. It was with these experiences that the book became alive. It's through the experience that I understood the words and what the books, what the what the words in the book, in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous was pointing to. And more got revealed. And I had a reference point now when I was reading the book. And uh and then having the experience of the amends was just another 
just incredible experience of like, you know, the book says nine out of 10 times the unexpected happened. And I would say 10 out of 10 times for me, the unexpected happened. Like there's nothing in my, uh, my, uh, way of thinking and living that was like, you know, you, 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 you face them, you face them and you, you know, you give back money. They don't even know that you owe, <laughs> you know, like, you know, this is not how I thought we rolled in life, you know? Yeah. And yet, you know, I was having this experience with this God that I was getting into a relationship with this dialogue I was creating, this willingness to step into the unknown in step two and this dialogue and this relationship in step three, you know, and she was she was a great like um, way that she reminded me of what this was about. Right. And, you know, granted, you know, let's not forget I was willing the willingness was present. It was a gift. The willingness was present as a result of that step one experience. I can't stress enough the importance of that step one experience as a baseline for the willingness to take this radical action, right? To step into the unknown, to write inventory, to self-reflect, to evaluate, to pray and meditate when I don't, didn't think I could. And I remember in early recovery, very early on, she asked me to sit quietly for two minutes a day. And I was like, oh, no problem. No big deal. Two minutes. But, you know, oh, my God, 29 seconds later, I was in hell. It was torture. You know, the mind was loud, like I was just like restless, you know, what's for dinner, memory came up, a song I don't even like was stuck in my head on repeat. And there was there was willingness to tell her the truth about that. It was there was willingness to as I was having these experiences that I wouldn't have had on my own. Um, she was introducing me to the depth of my being. She was introducing me to to who I really was. I realized I didn't really know who I was. I, re I really didn't know how to live life. And uh, all of that played a part in my experience of the 12 steps and my journey through the step work. She gave of herself. She gave of her time selflessly. There was no agenda. You know, there was no sense of like controlling me or directing me. She didn't take on a role of a mom or a or a, an employer or anything like that. She told me early on, you know, I want to get you independent of me and dependent on on this power and the truth that's within you she reflected back the truth that was deep within me it was like a process of an awakening of that you know she wanted me to come home come home to myself come home to the depth of my being and she was an example of that she was an example of that so when she spoke she transmitted a message she transmitted a message because the message was coming through her from a depth of her. You know, it wasn't intellectual. You know, it wasn't something that she read somewhere or it sounded good, you know. And I just, that left such an impression on me. And I have this experience of eight and nine and each step empowers me into the next step and gets me more curious and gets me more willing. And I'm sensing this presence. I'm sensing that God is doing for me what I cannot do for myself, that um, that I can receive information from some other place than the mind. I'm experiencing my heart opening up. I'm, I, I want more. I'm hungry for more because any kind of awakening inherent in any kind of waking up is I want to wake up more. I want to know the truth more. I started valuing truth and love over anything else. Because I saw in my inventory that everything else failed. And then I I, uh, I get to continue to live that way in step 10. And she held my hand and explored spiritual practices with me for many years in step 11. She introduced me to chanting and to spiritual teachers. We went on retreats together. She actually drove me to another state to a, a, a silent uh, spiritual meditation retreat that I attended for 10 nights. She dropped me off and picked me back up. And it was something that she's done before. And I was willing to explore. It was like a spiritual marketplace out there and a playground for uh, deepening, deepening this awakening. And, um, and of course, after the first few amends, she was like, okay, you're ready. And I'm like, ready for what? 
<laughs> you know, I was enjoying all of these things that I was experiencing. It's like, I'm ready to sponsor. I'm like, what? <laughs> I have nothing to offer. I'm not like you. I don't know what to do. I was petrified. I just, you know, like I just personalized this like service thing. I, I was still building on this element of trust, right? That the words will come. She focused on really my being, the state of my being rather than what I'm doing. It was always about honoring the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous and knowing the right information and having the experience that I've had. But she really pointed me to this place of like trust, like trusting that all that I need to do is show up. And you know, enough experiences, but I've had enough experiences by then where I, number one, couldn't deny that. And number two, I was honoring that. I was honoring the manipulated pause that happened while I was in, under the influence of alcohol. I was honoring the fact that I, like she showed up in front of me unannounced and uninvited. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like without my permission. I felt like, you know, there were all these gifts that were happening in my life. How could I not trust? How could I not trust? And by that time, something else was starting to happen, right? Our, the heart opens up and the heart wants to serve. The heart just wants to serve. I think like step 10 is like, a, like a, if I was to summarize like this step 10 experience was like truth and step 11 was love. And step 12 is an expression of that, right? It's like without even my permission, right? There's nothing in it for me. And yet I am moved. I am moved to make myself available. And think step 12 is really about making ourselves available and wanting to uh, shout this from the rooftop because it's incredible what has occurred, right? Not of my own doing, you know? And um and I think that that's that's really what they mean by gratitude in an act, gratitude in action. I remember like calling her from a payphone at this sober house that I was living in, and I remember saying, "I don't understand these gratitude lists. Everybody's writing gratitude lists. I tried writing a gratitude list this morning, and it's never ending. Like every time I finish one word, I think of like, oh, I'm grateful for my breath. I'm grateful for the bed I'm in. I'm grateful that the sun's out. I'm grateful for another day. You know, I'm grateful for breakfast this morning. It's just never ending. And she said, forget the lists. Be gratitude. And I just remember like being paused by that. You know, what would it look, what would my life look like? What would my day look like? If gratitude was expressing itself, how would gratitude express itself through the day? What would that action look like? Not to think about gratitude, not to make lists in my head about gratitude or what's in it for me, but how does gratitude move? And I found that to just be like an incredible signpost that she was pointing to me to this like element of being direct my attention to what you would have me be not do while i was while i was uh, developing this relationship with life and the way that i related to life that was based on trust and not on fear what does that look like what does my day look like if i trust everything that shows up in front of me and i see it as an invitation And um, I would say that in the beginning of uh, making myself to, available to sponsorship, I just really wanted to be a good sponsee. I didn't want to disappoint this woman. And I wanted to do everything that this woman said because I just loved her so much. I didn't think I had anything to offer. I, I didn't think I could do it like her. You know, I just still had remnants of just that smallness and insecurity and mental anxiety about what to do and will I do it right? And I, I can see that it came from a good place. Like I just didn't want to mess it up, right? I just didn't want to mess it up. And I just wanted to do it the right way. But it's about experience. 
it's about the experience. I realize more and more that it's about really showing up and making ourselves available and the rest is up to God. And it's like those first sponsees that taught me that really, really fast, you know, because I made myself available to sponsorship and there was an attraction. I attracted people to ask me to work with them or to ask me to take them through the work. And, and that was as a result of the fact that I, I was having this experience of an awakening as a result of working the steps. And the second part of it is that I carried that message. I carried that message. That message of having had a spiritual awakening as a result of the steps. That was the message that I carried. I was responsible to give an accurate account of the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous and, uh, and the process of the 12 steps. My job was to take them through the 12 steps, not to chat with them, not to be their financial advisor, their therapist, their psychologist, psychiatrist, their landlord or anything like that. And because I was having this awakening and she was also like right there next to me, living by next to me, I was accountable to the way I was doing it. And because she gave me this experience of the way I did it with her, that's all I had to offer to somebody else. So that was perfect and it was beautiful and it was simple and it was right on point. And as I had the experience of it, I learned more and more how to verbalize that, what sponsorship means for me and what my job is to carry this message. All I know is how to take you through the 12 steps as outlined in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. Everything else is, I don't know what they say in America, bacon, side dish, extra, whatever, cherry on the top. None of that matters. I'm here to share my experience of going through the 12 steps with you. And that's all I want to do. And, um, and so she set this stage for me. When somebody would ask me to work with them, the first thing I would do is qualify them. Qualify them. And make sure that they've qualified themselves. Do you have what I have? Can you relate to this? Are you really an alcoholic? What is your experience? What's your relationship when you drink? Do you have the mental obsession? Do you have the phenomenon of craving? You know, do you have this thing that I have? And what does that mean? And what it entails and what my job is, is to take you through the steps, whether I read the book to you and we take direction every time that the book says direction or whether I just like get you writing in no time, basically. And we have a fifth step booked. And, uh, and I've learned that I've learned that she didn't give me a lot of time to write inventory. I had a fifth step book while I was writing inventory this is not like, I don't want to be taking somebody through the 12 steps for three years. Like it's now <laughs> it's, it's like, you're dying. <laughs> you're dying. You're dying. Here's a life raft. You know, all you need, all you are responsible for is willingness. And I realized in my own experience, the only thing I did give her was my willingness. And she gave me an invitation. I said yes to to have this experience with the 12 steps and then see if it works or not. And boy, did it work. I was changed. Change came over me. My heart was woken up. I didn't trust my mind. Common sense became uncommon sense, you know, and all these things that the book talks about, you know, and, uh, um, so here I am, uh, 17 and a half years later, the one thing that's been consistent in my 17 and a half years as a member of Alcoholics Anonymous is sponsorship. <laughs> I think mean, really, you know, I talk to a lot of people, a lot of people call me, a lot of people call me with a lot of time. And I can't tell you how many of them say something's missing and you know, I'm not inspired. And I think I have to go through inventory again. And I need another experience of the big book. And I need to read. And all of that may be valid. But when I ask people, how many people are you working with? <laughs> There's a pause. This working, you know, being accountable to having sponsees in my life or people that I'm serving kept me accountable to reading the book. 
kept me accountable to not being a hypocrite, kept me accountable to asking them to do certain things and checking whether I'm doing those things and whether I'm an example of that and whether I be really believe that. Kept me accountable if I have unfinished amends or unfinished business or things are coming up. Kept me accountable to continue to take my own personal inventory when I was wrong to prompt him in. Kept me accountable to seeking because I also want to seek with them and I want to introduce them to certain practices or books or literature or prayer or meditation. Kept me accountable to being available once a week to them because when I sponsor somebody, we're meeting once a week. We're reading the book. We're talking about the work. We're talking about the steps. We're on to the next thing that needs to be experienced. And in 17 years, I have had other um uh, moments where life hits you, you know, because it's one thing when I came in to this, into the rooms, I was like 27 years old with a drinking history when I did my first fourth step. But what did my fourth step look like and my fifth step look like after that failed relationship in sobriety? What did my fourth and fifth step look like and what was my emotional state like? and my trust in this power when my dad died suddenly? What did that look like? It is this, the... Um, service it's sponsorship it's tw step 12 that's kept me in the game that's kept it alive that's inspired me i can't tell you how many times i'm thinking about myself or what's in it for me or i'm emotionally wrecked by by fear or some mental anxiety or something is going in my life or something is not going the way i thought it should go or I, that i wanted it to go and there's some uncertainty in my life or unpredictability and i have to show up for a service for fun and for free. <laughs> and like not, you know, the mind is commenting now, oh, I don't feel like it, I'm tired. I'm, you know, I have to focus on this and that. And then I show up to service and, and an hour later, I'm a different person. Everybody knows this, that does this thing. You guys know what I'm talking about when I say this. It rings true to so many of us. Right. If selfishness and self-centeredness is the root of my problems, then selflessness is my solution. If feeling disconnected is what my life looked like, especially when I was the center of the universe, then what does it look like to be connected and to feel a part of the human race where it's inclusive of the people that are in my life and the people that I encounter? It created a vast amount of connection for me. My life is rich. My life is rich. It's too rich. It's too full. Do you know what I mean? It's incredible. I'm overwhelmed with the amount of connection and phone calls and the people in my life that I share my life with. I don't have time to feel isolated or lonely or depressed. Like that's like not in, in the forte you know what I mean, of my life currently. And I don't know if it's always going to be like that, but I cannot believe it's been 17 years like that. 17 years. I have been a made, making myself available to sponsoring. For 17 years, there's never been uh, less than three to five people that I'm currently taking through the big book or the 12 steps. I'm not saying to pat myself on the back. I'm saying that that's been a gift to me that saved my life few times it saved my life when i would get lost or i would float away or certain practices would fall away it would be like you know within a few days or within a week or it would be a short amount of time that i would be read, redirected back to what's most important and uh and this feeling of gratitude this wanting to honor that manipulated pause that happened on September 14, 2006, under the influence of alcohol, wanting to honor this Alcoholics Anonymous in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous that I get have gotten to experience the invitation and the direction of my sponsor. She showed up in front of me and selflessly gave of her time. That still moves me. It's not like it moved me for the first two, three years. It's still very present in my life, you know? And uh, and then to watch other people recover, to watch them get, you know, from, you know, the people that I meet to the people that they become, and then to watch them carry the message to others. I mean, the book even talks about this is an experience you must not miss. 
You're not going to want to miss it. It's the bright spot of our lives. You know, besides the fact that I'm constantly reminded of how much trouble I'm in. I, you know, <laughs> I, uh, that sober house I ended up in, I run it now. I mean, talk about like I, my office where I actually sit in my office is where my bed used to be, where I lived for seven years. Unbelievable. Not a career I chose, not the thing I wanted to do, not a job I looked for. I'm definitely not living in a state that I wanted to live in. I was a New Yorker. New Yorkers don't end up in New Jersey. You know, I'm still in New Jersey. You know what I mean? Like none of my life looks the way that I thought my life would look like. And it's looking so much better. It's like the third step talks about, you know, giving our will and our life over to the uh, to the higher power. Giving my will and my life over to anybody was a wiser choice than in my hands, by the way. Anybody can run my life better than me. Anybody can manage it better than me. The girl that walked into the, uh, walked in, for, you know, oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's when the curse comes out, it's a, it's the way I express my passion, but I apologize for that. You know, the way I was like dragged on my deathbed into Alcoholics Anonymous, what it was there to defend. The hideousness of my life running my will was so evident in, in, in step four and step five, as I had the experience, you know, I, uh, all of those experiences, my own experience through the step where, and you know what's another thing that happens? And then I made myself available to sponsorship and I moved to sponsor and I'm willing to sponsor and I want to sponsor and I'm afraid to sponsor and I have to have this experience. And with each experience, I, I trust my inner gut a little bit more and I trust that an intuitive thought or action will show up if I just show up. If I just show up, my job is just to show up and to be willing to, to uphold the truth to tell the truth. That's all my job is. And as a result of that, through those experiences, I'm a little bit more in tune with, you know, what works and what doesn't work and with, uh, you know, with my own understanding and effectiveness, right? And um, every experience I had Every feeling I had, every emotion I had, every thought I've had, the people that were in front of me have had. <laughs> it's like they all had my thoughts and feelings. <laughs> it's like you walk into an AA meeting and everybody has your thoughts and feelings. Not very unique. <laughs> you know what I mean? But all of their fifth steps became my fifth steps. It was more and more evident to me that we all suffer from one alcoholism. And the self manifested in various ways is what defeats us. And that the resentments and fears and everybody has like a little bit of a different shape and side to their story, but it's all like really coming from the same pot. And it was like really, you know, watching them recover or watching them go through the steps or watch uh, listening to their fifth steps was a reflection and a mirror of my own life and my own work, right? It was like a constant reminder. It was a constant reminder. And that's what I mean by it kept me in the game. It very much kept me in the game. And it couldn't have been any other way anyway. Because when you really have a spiritual awakening as a result of working the steps, you want to give it away. No, not so that I can keep sober. No, it's weird. There's nothing in it for me, it feels like. And yet you're moved to do it. You have to do it. You need to do it. It's like something wants to do it through you. Through you. That's why my job is just to show up and make myself available to it. My job is to say yes to the best of my ability. And that element of like wanting to serve and not wanting to hurt anybody is all part of that 12-step awakening, right? And wanting to connect to my fellow peers and wanting to be a part of the human race and wanting to successfully live. Because to successfully live was not for me to have success or a career or money in my bank. It's to meet life 100%, to feel alive 100%. 
And I, I, I sense that the most through service and service is taking on a lot of meanings and, you know, like, um, you know, whether I'm serving my mom or whether I'm serving my neighbor or whether I'm serving at my job or how I'm doing anything becomes an element of serving. How I'm doing anything becomes an expression of that love, an expression of that trust that the intuitive thought or action will come if I just make myself available and that I trust that it comes. And when I'm in that place, I don't take credit for it because it's not of my own doing. It's being done through me, right? When I think I'm doing it, I tire easily. <laughs> the 11 step talks about that, you know? And I suddenly think I have the power, but I didn't have the power to sober myself up. And I didn't have the power to change myself. I don't have the power to sober anybody up or change them. I want to plant seeds. I want to tell the truth. I want to serve truth and love. I'm not serving them. I'm serving truth and love. I'm not serving them. I'm serving Alcoholics Anonymous. And that keeps me humble. Because I don't know if I'm going to be sober for the rest of my life. And I don't know what tomorrow brings. And I know that life is unmanageable inherently. And I know it's unpredictable. And I know that nothing is guaranteed. But yet in a day-to-day, moment-to-moment, I get to live that anything is possible and all is welcome. And there's a reason why this person ended up in front of me. And as a result of that, I've learned so much from them. All of the people I have taken through the work, the, all of the fifth steps I've listened to served me in some way or another. Sometimes they came at the right time when I was going through the most difficult things in my life. And, you know, what are the most difficult things for us humans? I don't know about you, but sex and money, you know, like we all feel a little, you know, and I don't mean sex as an act of sex and I don't mean money, but like financial insecurities and jobs and and, you know, relationships and all the feelings that come with that and stuff like that, the heartbreaks and the and all of that being alone or whatever it is, it's manifested itself. My humanness has manifested itself in various ways throughout my 17 and a half years sober and. Um, being a member of Alcoholics Anonymous, wanting to wake up more and wanting to serve love and truth has, um, I don't even know they have the words, kept it fresh for me, fresh and alive, fresh and alive to the point where I'm still curious about it. And I'm constantly learning. That's what it feels like. But of course, I'm uniquely qualified to help alcoholics. And there's nothing like watching somebody's eyes light up and becoming a productive member of society. There's nothing like it. I mean, it's incredible. I work in the field. I, I run that those sober houses now. I've been there 17 years more. I, um, you know, um, that I do for money. I don't consider that service. How I do it is can be a part of my service but i do it for money so i don't consider that service so all of my services after work or before work i currently you know talk to a woman every morning before work at 8 a.m and i work with a woman almost every night monday through friday and sometimes sunday nights after work i uh like doing it i want to do it i uh it keeps me sane it keeps me present it keeps me connected um, um, it gets me in touch with that gratitude. I think that's how the gratitude is really expressing itself. And the book really talks in working with others. You know, the chapter working with others gives very detailed, you know, like directions on what sponsorship is about and what service is about and what we tell them and what we don't tell them and the way we show up. But I think that I always think about my sponsor and the way she showed up for me because that was the most tangible experience I've had of how she carried me, carried me in those early days when I was stumbling through the steps like a baby learning how to walk. 
I came into Alcoholics Anonymous and I was a baby learning how to walk. So I would like take a step and fall and take a step and fall and take a step and fall, just like a baby learning how to walk, you know? And she would help me get up and and uh, dive a little bit more deeper and be willing to take another step and carried me through that. And like, I wanna show up like that. I wanna be a, a safe space for somebody. You know, I want to be an example that there's another way to live. I want to be an example of freedom. You know, she she showed me that freedom was available. She didn't stand there in front of me saying, you got to go to five meetings a day, every single day, and call me every single day. And, and uh, you know, be careful not to pass by a liquor store. I mean, off the bat, this woman was like, you know, you can be free. <laughs> You can be free. You know, she exuded that. I wanted that freedom. I didn't want relief. I wanted freedom. I want to be an example of that for somebody else. And a byproduct of having an experience with the steps and continuing to work with the steps and continuing to seek through prayer and meditation to improve my conscious contact with God and continuing to be accountable to my own self-reflection. Um, you know, makes me feel uh, that I can be that for others, that that's possible and available. The greatest ex the greatest compliment I ever got from ever in my life, I think, in, in recovery has been, you're an alcoholic? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know what I mean? Like, that's incredible. And I get to watch women recover and be mothers and be wives and, you know, uh, you know, pursue like dream jobs of their choice and, and education and be great members of Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, standing up straight and being that safe space for somebody else. And that's just incredible. That's not of my doing. And that's not of my sponsor's doing. You know, they say, you know, don't put anybody on a pedestal. I don't want to put anybody on a pedestal. I do put her on a pedestal. I just love her and adore her so much. And it's okay. She's my guru. She's my teacher. She's my sister. She's my friend. She's my sponsor. There's been many teachers over 17 years and many elders that have inspired me and influenced me and served me in various ways. I've, uh, you know, shared my fifth step with others. My sponsor has shared her fifth step with me. Talk about humility. Everything she's ever done, I bring into the lives of others. This is a woman that's taken me through the steps and then at some point brought her fifth step to me. She equalized us. She showed me that it's shoulder to shoulder. Do you know what I mean? All of that, everything, she is the tangible example. This is why I'm so grateful. She was the tangible example of what this journey can be about. And I get to do that with my sponsees. And i that's why it's not just like Lena that I talk to. I can pick up the phone and be honest with any of my sponsees of what's currently going on in my life and do a, a spot check inventory, step 10 spot check inventory on the spot with anybody in my life. Because I've created a life of wanting to share this life with people who are on a spiritual journey with me. I feel all of that is a part of this service and all of that is a part of step 12, which talks about practicing these principles in all of our affairs. It's not like I have this AA life and I have this spiritual life and then I have life. It's not AA life and then here's my spiritual life and then here's the rest of my life. The whole thing is spiritual. All of life is a teaching. Everything is a is a is an opportunity for service. Every moment is an opportunity for trust to 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 go deeper and develop. Nothing is compartmentalized. Like all of life is welcome, and yet there is this this place in my heart that's for AA. You know what I mean? Because I'm uniquely qualified. I can live all the life I want. I can be as free as I want to be, but I'm an alcoholic. I am an alcoholic. I'll always be an alcoholic. I've buried people who have had 20 and 25 years sober. I've housed them 
in my sober house after 20 or 25 years of sobriety. I'm not delusional about what it means to be an alcoholic. I don't take it for granted. The whole thing is a gift. All of it is grace. All of it is an invitation. And somehow, and I don't know if this is true, but I'm going to say it. I've been serving and sponsoring for 17 years and I still feel fresh and it still feels alive. And I wonder, is that why? The book says that's why. We say that's why. I just want to be totally honest. Possibly that's why. It works. Fate without work is dead. Am I serving that power? Am I serving that love? And am I serving that truth? If I am, it always includes you. And you is anyone I encounter, plus I'm uniquely qualified for the alcoholics. Because yeah, I speak that language. I know what it's like to be powerless. I know what it's like to drink when I don't want to drink. My sister doesn't understand that. She doesn't want to take that second sip. She's nauseous and she feels sleepy and she's buzzed. And she doesn't care about taking a second sip of that drink. But I know what it's like to drink when you don't want to drink. And you have every reason not to drink. And, you know, my dad, when he tried to get sober, there was no Alcoholics Anonymous in my country. And he died from this illness. So how could I not be grateful for the message that's been carried to me and the tangible experience I had of this human being carrying it to me and wanting to honor that and the power that worked through her and the power that I've witnessed worked through me and the power I've witnessed worked through many of the women I've worked with over many years. How could I not wanna just continue to serve that? I'm serving that, that service to me. Step 12. Well, I hope that was all right. And thanks so much for letting me share. And I hope that was okay.